Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of the differential diagnosis of the loss of cortical medullary interface. As we were finishing last time, I mentioned renal failure, and renal failure is kind of a global term. It's a range of diseases ranging from infection to drug-induced renal injury to perfusion changes, maybe due to dehydration, it can be due to therapy, be it chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation therapy. Uh, it can be due to, we said, infection. So let's take a look at some of the things. Now, one of the things we all do is scan a lot of oncology patients. Now, obviously, we sometimes scan for renal cell or other renal tumors, but we scan for many, many things. And the kidneys are always part of the study. We look for hydro, we look for metastasis, but you also want to look at the cortical medullary interface. This is a patient with relapsed AML. You'll see we have a good injection. You look at the aorta and renal arteries, and the kidneys are normal to a bit large in size, but you don't see the cortical medullary interface. And as we look at it a bit further, there is some perhaps subtle suggestion of the cortical medullary interface, particularly in the coronal views but you don't really see that differentiation of 90 Hounsfield units. It looks very, very flat. And this is a really nice example of the loss of cortical medullary interface. And you have to think about why. Could it be infection? Well, it could be, but then you should see areas of decreased attenuation. Could there be infiltration in the kidney? Could there be something with the blood supply? Could the patient be hypotensive? All of those are possibilities. We don't see a whole lot else beyond the kidneys, some thickening of the right colon, maybe a few nodes. And the kidneys, as we mentioned, are a bit large, but still, what is going on here? Why do we have this loss of cortical medullary interface? And that's one of the complications of patients developing renal failure due to typically chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is one of the things that can cause the loss of renal function and the loss of cortical medullary differentiation. Often they'll change the chemotherapy, often they'll hydrate the patient a little bit better, maybe decrease dose, but it's important for us to say to the referring doc, hey, the kidneys look a bit large, there's a loss of cortical medullary interface, uh, patient doesn't have history of infection, this doesn't look like infection, patient's not hypotensive, could this be chemotherapy related? And indeed it was. We also see things like this in patients with other injuries. This is a burn patient two weeks post-surgery. You don't see the good cortical medullary interface, the kidneys do function, but there's patchy changes by the cortical medullary interface, which you can see nicely here. The cortical medullary interface does not enhance as much as it typically should. There is some difference, but it's decreased, and the decrease is better accentuated on the coronal views. You also see the patient's large pericardial effusion. So what's going on here? The patient's not on chemotherapy. It's a burn patient. The patient, you can see, had trauma by the left hemipelvis as well. There's fluid present. The muscles are a bit low density. So now you're trying to put everything together. A patient several weeks post-trauma with muscular injury, the kidneys function, but not properly. There's a loss of cortical medullary interface. What exactly is going on in the kidneys? In many ways, it looks almost like the prior case with chemotherapy. Again, something is going on in the cortical medullary interface. Something is really damaging the kidney at that point. And in patients who've had trauma, particularly muscular trauma, there's something called rhabdomyolysis, which can cause very much the same thing. And in burn patients, rhabdomyolysis is very common. The patients can get renal shutdown and renal failure. Patients may need dialysis if there's significant muscle injury with rhabdomyolysis. It's a clinical syndrome caused by damage to skeletal muscle and release of its breakdown products into the circulation. And it can be followed by acute kidney injury as a severe complication. The belief is that the kidney injury is triggered by the myoglobin as a toxin responsible, but that's probably a little bit simplified. But I think the important thing 
the decision to initiate renal replacement therapy in clinical practice should not be made on the basis of the myoglobin or creatinine uh, phosphatase serum concentrations, but on patient's renal function. So very, very important. And it's an important syndrome. Elevated CPK of at least five times the upper limit of normal is an important diagnostic marker. So if you have a patient who has trauma, particularly muscular trauma, you need to be thinking about this. And if you have a patient with trauma and the patient's renal function is going down, you need to be thinking about rhabdomyolysis. Very important. Now, there's not a day that passes that we don't think about renal infection, right? Because when you have a busy ER practice, polynephritis, renal stone disease are all common things in the ER setting. Range of infection is extensive, right? Most patients is like E. coli, but you can have TB, you can have histo, you can have all sorts of infections. The more severe the infection, the more the perfusion changes, and changes can be unilateral or bilateral. They can be focal or diffuse. Now, in terms of renal infection, in theory, if you had to pick one phase for detecting infection, typically you would end up saying the later phase may be excretory because all the work on striated nephrograms for infection were done by Mort Bosniak on IVPs, which were always late phase imaging. On non-contrast scans, you can see the presence of stones, obviously, but you could overlook the presence of pathology. Now, sometimes if it's unilateral, even bilateral, you could recognize renal size changes. The kidneys get larger early. You can look at the perirenal and pararenal space for stranding. But to really call infection on CT or infarction or many other things, you need IV contrast. So here you quickly look at the cortical medullary interface bilaterally, and then you start looking at multiple areas in both kidneys, where there's the creased attenuation, very nicely shown. Okay, multiple patchy areas, striated nephrograms. You see in the cortex, these striations, very impressive on the right. It's on the left as well, but less impressive. That's a very, very good finding for infection. Now, I mentioned about late phase imaging being, in theory, the best. Occasionally, and the word is occasionally, you can miss early or subtle infection on the arterial phase, but that's pretty unusual. A really nice example here of multifocal acute polynephritis. You look at the vessels, the vessels are intact, but in the MIP imaging on the right, those changes at the cortical medullary interface are particularly nicely shown. And then on the excretory phase imaging bilaterally, you see the decreased areas of attenuation. And in this case, although we saw the changes of polynephritis very nicely on the arterial phase imaging, at the end of the day, it was better seen on the delayed, but it was seen on any phase you would have, but non-contrast. Here's the coronal views. Again, excretion of contrast. Now, one thing I like to mention, our delays for uh, excretory or about four to five minutes. Many people would say eight to 10 minutes. You waste a lot of time. The other issue, when you do that eight to 10 minutes, the contrast gets so dense in the calyces, you have significant beam hardening artifact and you can overcall the presence of infection. So four minutes usually works very nicely and you can see the excretion of contrast as well as those patchy areas of decreased attenuation, very nicely shown and shown well also on these volume rendered images. Now, another example, native kidneys, not very impressive on the non-contrast, though maybe if you look at the left kidney, there is some stranding by the renal pelvis. There's some stranding by the edge of the kidney. You might think, could the patient have passed the stone? You would look for that. That's a possibility. Could this be tumor? I guess theoretically, I couldn't 100% exclude tumor. But here it is very nicely on the early phase imaging. Really good example of the cortical medullary interface being decreased. The stranding around the kidney was a good sign that pathology was present, even on the non-contrast scan. Coronal views nicely showing you the mid third of the left kidney where the decreased attenuation is present and the stranding is seen with the normal appearing right kidney.
And then here it is as we go toward the excretory phase when the stranding is present, though this is still late venous, nicely shown. Or in this case, again, the kidneys look large, particularly the left kidney. This was a fever workup. There was no specific site of disease suspected. But you can see very nicely the left kidney is large, patchy areas of decreased attenuation, very classic for renal infection, maybe some subtle changes on the right. And this is very good for an example of E. coli acute polynephritis. Now, some patients are prone to complications in the kidney, immunosuppressed patients are one of them, patients with sickle cell disease. And this was a patient with sickle cell with hematuria. You can see with contrast, the right kidney cortical medullary interface looks good. The left is not as bright. The left kidney is larger. There's stranding around the kidney and by the pelvis present. Here's a few more images again. The multiple areas of decreased attenuation looking very similar to the prior three cases I showed you, consistent with polynephritis. On the global volume rendered views, you can see the left kidney besides the decreased attenuation in the upper pole, the thinning of the cortical medullary interface. The left kidney is also larger, and in acute polynephritis, a larger kidney is not going to be uncommon. And then you take it for the spectrum. Remember, most patients with renal infection, they'll be treated with antibiotics, they'll do well. But here was a sickle cell patient with known E. coli, had not been doing well, patient comes back, the right kidney looks larger than the left and there's decreased attenuation even on the non-contrast. But then as you scan into the kidney, you see a low density mass, cystic, you see perfusion changes in the kidney. Remember, one of the reasons people recommend CT in a patient with pilo, who theoretically has been treated but is doing poorly, is to look for complications. And the classic complication, as shown in this case, is polynephritis with an abscess. So this is an E. coli abscess. You can see peri and pararenal space involvement, as well as cortical involvement with the areas of cystic change centrally, particularly nicely seen on the coronal views as well. Just a really nice example of a renal abscess that was there because the patient did not take their antibiotics. You can see the changes in the spine very nicely, show you the patient's sickle cell vertebral bodies. And again, in addition to the abscess in the lower pole of the right kidney, there is acute pyelonephritis in the upper pole of the right kidney with decreased attenuation also seen. Here's the sclerotic bone changes of sickle cell disease in addition to the abscess. And here's the abscess seen very nicely on the patient's cinematic rendering. So again, in the spectrum of infection, cortical medullary interface changes can be the earliest sign of focal pyelonephritis, can be a sign of diffuse pyelonephritis, can be focal or global. And as you proceed from infection to abscess, the changes will also be well-defined. Now, another thing, an entity that causes perfusion change relates to the vascular supply. And one of them relates to the renal vein. And this could be from nephrotic syndrome to hypercoagulability states, to polycythema vera, to tumor extension in the IVC, uh, particularly renal cell carcinoma, and to trauma as well. Now, when you look at the renal vein, of course, you're looking for the size of the renal vein. You're looking for the presence of thrombus. Patients with acute thrombus often have a large kidney. You may see difference in the cortical medullary differentiation. Uh, early on, if the kidney is poorly functioning, you may not see that cortical medullary interface. Or in other cases, you'll see a persistent cortical medullary interface. As with infection, you may see thickening of the renal fascia and stranding in the perinephric space. So here's a nice example. At first glance in the patient's left kidney, maybe you can think about polynephritis, but as you start looking, the renal vein looks like it has thrombus. And again, there's a range of things for thrombus. I mentioned tumor, but infection as well. Here, the patient has infection of the left kidney. Another example, thrombus 
in the patient's left renal vein, very nicely shown in a patient with an endovascular stent in place. You can see the difference in the cortical medullary interface between the right and left kidney. And the coronal view really shows you the full extent of that involvement of the renal vein thrombosis. And again, the differential enhancement of cortex medulla was not that substantial, but is definitely present. Or in this case, on non-contrast, the kidneys look large, but once you give IV contrast, the large renal vein thrombosis is seen. The perfusion changes, the difference between cortical medullary interface and the right and the left kidney, very nicely shown. Or in this case, an unusual renal vein thrombus, minimal changes in the left kidney. The patient previously had a right nephrectomy for a renal cell carcinoma. And again, very nicely shown. Uh, it's interesting, there's little cortical medullary change despite the renal vein thrombosis, which is probably going to be chronic. We talk about infarcts being focal. So look at the right kidney. You can see the focal infarct and then you see the right renal artery. So when I look for infarcts, we look for renal vein thrombosis, we also look at the arteries, and again, wedge-shaped, you see the loss of cortical medullary interface. So when I talk about loss of cortical medullary interface and I speak about vascular processes, we are addressing both the artery side and the venous side of the kidney. Here the veins look good, here is the right renal artery with a thrombus very nicely shown there. And then of course another example of an infarct in the left kidney, which was in part related to the thrombus, you can see in the patient's renal artery. Sometimes we've seen involvement by both the renal artery and the vein. But again, the perfusion changes are very nice and it's looking at the secondary findings that really help you make the diagnosis. One thing that I find helpful to me at times is renal infarcts usually are sharper than infection. Infection is more diffuse, it can be sharp, but I think infarcts tend to be sharper. And again, infarcts, I mentioned some of the causes from trauma to embolism to thrombosis to vasculitis to renal vein, all possibilities. And again, we mentioned about renal infarcts being segmental or global. It can be an isolated process, a part of a multi-organ system process. They can be chronic in nature, and symptoms can range from pain to fever to hematuria. So it's often a uh, surprise diagnosis. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. I think we've covered a number of things. I want to speak about infarcts a little bit more. So Let's take a break here, think about what I've told you, and let's come back and finish this talk. See you in a moment. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.